how are you? Welcome back to my channel for a video that I think is super fun. I know it might appeal to a more niche audience, but this is going to be just like a bestie to bestie casual chat about what it's actually like to be a content creator. I've been doing this full time for between three and four years now, but I've been, I've been trying to do this full time since I was 18 years old and I am now 26. I'm here to basically just be super honest, answer all of the questions. Some of them might be a little bit more taboo and this is not gonna be one of those super planned, polished professional videos. This is just kind of hoping to bring a different perspective if it's something you're curious about, maybe even considering trying to get into. So I think the way I'm going to structure this is first, just a very brief overview of exactly what working in this field looks like in terms of revenue streams and um, like a general work day for me. And then I asked on Instagram, what are some of y'all's questions? And um, I haven't even looked at them yet. So it's gonna be a very first reaction. I also wanna say, if you've been around my channel for a while, I'm filming this on June 11th, and this is my first time having my nose untaped for even just a little bit. Um, I got permission from my doctor to have it untaped for you know an hour at a time here or there, and it just feels like it's ballooning right now. And I still have a bit of a frozen top lip. I'm gonna get it back eventually, but if I look a little funny, that's why. So let's get into the video. I started my YouTube channel when I was 18. It probably took about a year before I got monetized, so before I even made a penny. And you know, the first year I was making like $40 a month here or there, slowly, slowly, slowly. The next year, I just noticed every year things kind of just consistently doubled, at least in terms of the income that I was making. And by the time I was 22, so four years later, I was making the same amount of money that I was making serving tables, waiting tables at my restaurant job. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm making the same or more than I'm making at the restaurant. I'm gonna go ahead and transition to this full time and focus all my time on that. In order to actually live off of it, and granted I was also married at that time, so dual income household, um, in order to live off of it, it took me a little over four years to make a living. And I, I would say out of my content creator friends, that's pretty consistent. Of course, you could have a much quicker growth. You could have a much slower growth, but I would say like four-ish years seems to be the amount of time before you're making enough money to consider living off of it. I'm just gonna like briefly lay out the revenue streams and what they look like. I've done much more in-depth videos about this in the past. I know I did one in Vlogmas this last year and I've done some even before that, but the biggest stream of revenue for most creators are brand deals. I'm sure you're familiar with them. That's where the creator themselves says like, hey, this video is sponsored by blank. What is negotiated is a brand says, you need to talk about us for at least 60 seconds. Here's a couple talking points that you have to include, like mention our sale, mention that we're vegan, mention that we're whatever, and then make it your own. And here's some things to not say. So they give you a little brief and you talk about them for however much time they ask you to talk about them. And that's a brand deal. The second revenue stream is only really on YouTube. You don't get this on Instagram or TikTok. I know they have creator funds and stuff like that now, but YouTube, you get ad revenue. So that's where the video pauses and an ad break comes on and interrupts the video like good old fashioned TV. The way that works is YouTube says, hello advertiser, you're gonna pay us this amount per view and then we're gonna split this with the creator. Don't quote me on this, I think the creator gets 40% and YouTube gets 60%. So say if the advertiser pays 10 cents per view, then we get four cents, YouTube gets six cents every time someone is viewing that ad. Viewing and not skipping, creators actually get paid more. So if you really love a creator and you don't have a way to support them, viewing the ad breaks or clicking on their links are two free ways to help support them. The third revenue stream is affiliate marketing. For me, this isn't a ton. I don't make a lot off of this. I have some creator friends that make so much money off of affiliate marketing. And those creators are normally doing a ton of hauls and things of the sort. But what that is, you'll notice in my vlogs, I normally say, I'm gonna try to link as much as I can. Some of those links are affiliate, some of them aren't because there's just some brands that don't even offer affiliate programs. But like this top is Cezanne and I am, an affiliate of Cezanne so I can link their pieces and if I generate a sale I'll get 5%, 10%, whatever of the sale. So normally, you know, five bucks here or there if someone buys the $100 shirt. 
Um, so over time that can add up for me, like I said, it's not a lot of money because I don't link a ton of things, but for some people that's a really, especially fashion and beauty creators, that can be a really big revenue source. The last I'll mention, it's definitely not a primary revenue source, at least not for me, is some creators make their own product or they will collaborate with other brands and do like a collaboration product. Like, um, Aspen Ovard and her Tarte palette. Or for me, I did candles with um, Bailey B, who's a, a candle maker here. People can make good money off of that. I have never really profited hardly anything off of those types of things or even creating my own brand. They've more just been kind of a fun creative outlet. But if you have a big, big audience, creators can make a lot of money off that or if they choose something with a higher profit margin as well. Those are the general revenue streams and the general timeline it took me to be able to call this a job. Um, the last thing I want to mention is gear. I've gone through a lot of gear. I'm actually filming on this exact camera right now. This is just my older one that I had dropped. So it's my backup now in case something happens to this one. But I've gone through a lot of different things. My favorite camera is this. It's the Sony ZV-1. I had some big, fancy, expensive cameras. I don't even use them anymore. I just use this all the time because it's so compact and I put a mic on the top. Nowadays, iPhones are so good. You don't need to buy a camera. But if you really wanted to up your game, I recommend this because it's just cheaper than most alternatives and it works really well. But I'm just interested to see what you guys want to know that maybe isn't talked about as often in other types of videos. So I'm gonna pull up Instagram. By the way, that's where I kind of interact with people the most because sticker boxes, all those types of things just make it so easy. Okay, I'm seeing this question a lot. How do you know what to charge for brand deals? So when I was getting started, I had no idea. And this was my process, it's just kind of funny. I started getting some emails from some companies and they were like, hey, how much would you charge to talk about us for 60 seconds in a video? And I was like, I don't know. So I just kind of threw out a number. I was like, $100. And they were like, okay. And I was like, they said, okay, really quickly. Shoot, okay, I think I just way undersold myself, but I don't know. So the next time I got an email with so something similar, I would say $200. And they were like, okay. And I was like, shoot, am I still underselling myself? I don't know what any of this stuff is worth. So then I would just kind of be like, okay, so it seems like this is what they're valuing me at right now. And then, you know, next quarter, I would try pushing that a little bit. And each quarter I would, as I grew, would push it a little bit and would kind of figure out what I was worth that way. I know there's, you know, much better metrics and formulas you could go off of without playing the guessing game. There's a website eventually I ended up finding, it was called Social Blue Book, and they let you like attach your accounts and they will tell you generally what brands are willing to pay for all different types of posts. You could attach your Instagram and they'll say, you know, a brand that will pay this much for a story, this much for a feed post, et cetera. You could attach your YouTube, so on and so forth. I feel like rumor has it that they charge for that now. Um, I don't know, I haven't checked it out in literally probably four or five years. So it's a, that's a good resource. Or, um, you know, asking creator friends that are similar size, it's very taboo. Brands don't love for you to like ask other people like, hey, what did they pay you for this? But there is power and knowledge. And I, I do have creator friends that, you know, generally work with the same brands and have a similar size following and we'll text each other questions all the time or even saying like this brand asks for exclusivity meaning like say if it was a fiber brand they would say we don't want you to work with any other fibers any protein powders anything like that for three months that's just what exclusivity means so it's nice to have other people being like hey i saw you worked with this brand they said that they want me to have exclusivity did, did they ask that of you? Is that something I can ask to get out of? And how do you make those connections? Literally all of my online creator friends, I connected with them online before ever knowing them in person. I haven't organically just met a creator friend ever. <laughs> Max is right here. <laughs> you know, DMing people and being like, hey, love your content, you're doing a great job, is really how most of my friends came to be. What are some things that you should look out for that brands might ask of you? One thing that's really big besides exclusivities, which I just mentioned, is usage. Usage essentially means you are granting rights to the brand to use your footage, your name, your likeliness to promote their own product on their own channels, or even like, actual ads. I've had some of my ads be on Hulu, which was just like, you know, a portion of a sponsorship and they asked for usage and we negotiated a rate and they literally put it on Hulu as like an ad break. So a lot of times with newer creators, brands will try to kind of sneak that in for free because you think, oh yeah, sure, they can post it, whatever. But that is actually so valuable to a brand. 
I thought it was interesting coming from the acting world before this because I know how much money goes into advertising and to like creating a traditional commercial. And the funny thing is taking a sponsored portion actually converts better for a brand because it feels so much more authentic because it's a person sitting in their own home like telling you their actual thoughts instead of a perfectly poised actress or model. It just feels better to the consumer so it actually works better for the brand and you're giving it to them for so much cheaper than it costs them to make a commercial. How do you even get sponsors? Okay, I will say once you start building a little bit of a following, brands will come to you but normally at the beginning like I didn't really wanna work with any of the brands coming to me. You know what I mean? Like it's laser hair removal tools at home and like swimsuit brands and just things that didn't really feel in alignment with me. So what I did is I would actually just cold email and I would do it all the time. I remember one of the first brands I did this with was Third Love, which is a bra company that I just loved. Like all of my bras were Third Love and I was like, I love this brand. So I went to their website and normally under contact, you can find something that says like PR and collaborations or even sometimes media. And um, I would just cold email that email and I would just say, hey, my name's Mikkel. At the time I was like, I have a YouTube channel with 10,000 subscribers and I love your bras. I only wear your bras. I would be so excited to talk about what working with you in any capacity would look like. If you're interested, I made this little sheet and the sheet would have like, you know, a little bit about me, a little bit about my audience demographics. So like 10,000 subscribers, 98% female, the age ranges they are, the um, countries that they are, and then general rates. So I would say right now I'm booking YouTube integrations at $300 or whatever. And I would break it all down that way so that they would generally kind of know what my rates were. And you know, it was all just there for them. I don't know if that's as much of a thing anymore because all of those analytics are much more easily accessible to brands on their own. That's, that's what I would do with a few brands that I really loved and a few of them actually got back with me and it was the beginning of a long relationship and I got to work with them for years. And as my channel grew, I was able to start asking for higher rates. And it's so funny because I'm such a non-confrontational person, especially with money, with anything. I don't like to confront at all, but I have always been weirdly good at negotiating, which I'm thankful for. I think it's almost like my alter ego. I think it's something that is almost therapeutic for me because I'm like, in real life, I can't ask people for things. In email, I could say, actually, I think I'm worth a little bit more than that, which was always fun for me. That was one big hesitation about getting management, which we'll talk about later, but um, was I was like, I'm gonna really miss the actual like business negotiations of all these things because it is really fun for me to have the back and forth and the communication and um, it, it felt liberating is really the, the main verb I could choose for that. How many hours a week do you spend on work? Okay, this has changed immensely over the years. So many factors go into this. For example, for a while I was putting out four videos a week on YouTube. I was editing them all, all myself. I had no management. I was also doing a podcast. I was also running a little brand. And back in those days, like 2019, 2020, even part of 2021, I am ashamed to say, but I was probably, let me do a little bit of quick math. I was probably working between 70 and 80 hours a week for a few years. It was not a healthy work-life balance. I was constantly either filming or editing or answering emails or sleeping pretty much was my whole life. Nowadays, I have cut back. So I started working with my amazing editor a few years ago. And so handing that to her has taken, that alone has taken probably 20 hours a week off of my plate and she does that same amount of work in like eight hours and does so much better than me. And then, you know, I eventually got management who oversees a lot more of the contracts. So they'll negotiate for you and go back and forth with the brand and then look at the contract. They'll redline it, go back and forth about the legalities and they'll just keep on top of your schedule a little bit more saying like, hey, this brand asked for a TikTok, but it can't go live with in 72 hours of anything else sponsored on any other platform. So the only slot that I see available here is like Monday the 10th, whatever. They'll do all that type of stuff. And once I did that, that probably cut down on another 20, 30 hours a week for me. Now I'm working like maybe 30 hours a week, which is so nice because that's less than a full-time job. And I'm able to do things like go to a pottery studio and enjoy life a little bit more. But it took a 
big hustle to get to that point and it takes really trusting other people and giving up a big portion of income. So this is another thing. Like I said, this is just a casual chatty video. Editors typically work on an hourly rate. That can be anywhere between, you know, 30 and $150 an hour for someone to edit for you. And then management typically takes 15 to 20% of everything they negotiate for you. My management takes 20%. You know, that's an expense. But for me, it's worth having like a healthier work-life balance and working 30-ish hours a week probably. What are all the admin things that have to be done? A big part really is emails and boxes going back and forth with brands about everything, creative concept, the brief, the rate, the contract, the timeline everything that you go back and forth with the brand quite a few times before you even agree. <laughs> so that's just a lot of hours on the computer. That's a lot of admin. Um, then there's a lot of like more financial bookkeeping things. You have to keep track of invoicing brands, have they paid, you know, accounts receivable, all that sort of things, categorizing expenses. You're your own business essentially. So you have to really keep track of all of your records, all of your books for taxes, um, paying your invoices. If you have any sort of employees, that's a really big thing. And then of course there is the actual coordinating of the videos. There's brainstorming ideas. There's writing out prompts. There's figuring out your your schedule. And then when a video goes live, there's a lot of communications with responding to comments. The uploading of the video is a lot of admin work as well. It takes me normally a couple hours to create the thumbnail, to create the description box, to affiliate link all of the products that I'm linking, to create something to share on Instagram, to promote it, to do the timestamps, the tags, um, the end screen, all of those sorts of things. That's a lot of just like computery admin type of thing. And of course, if you're editing, I still edit all of my own like Instagram, TikTok, vertical content because it's not as involved. But if you're editing a YouTube video, that is a few hours per video, depending on how in depth you're going as well. So there's a lot of time on Final Cut Pro or Adobe Premiere or whatever software you use. I remember the first time a brand asked me for an invoice and I had to Google how to make an invoice. <laughs> we were starting from scratch, baby. What are some red flags that will make you decline a brand deal? Honestly, the creative. That's something I always ask for because a brand that I love could reach out like that I adore and say, hey, we wanna do the sponsorship and not tell you much about it. And of course, I'm like, I love you, would love to work with you, but I always ask like, what are, what's your creative concept first? Like, what are requirements? Do I have full control? Or are you wanting this to be something that feels too much like a cringy ad that I don't wanna do? And sometimes I've declined brands I love because they're like, no, we want this Instagram reel to be you sitting talking about these talking points for the whole minute of the reel. And I'm like, I love you, but that's not enjoyable for my viewer. Um, I've regretted the couple times I have done that. And now I'll fight back a little bit more on creative power saying, you know, how about we make this more of like a vlog? And I just like talk about it for, you know, 20 seconds of the reel, but there's other things that are just interesting for people to watch as well. So if a brand and I can't agree on creative, I'll, I'll decline that. And then in the reverse too, if I love the creative of a brand deal, I will take lower than I'm worth because it just sounds so fun to do anyways. Um, I'm trying to think of an example, you know, like I just did a Lululemon little thing and they were like, you want to just do a little reel like of you, or it was a YouTube short of you in the mirror showing a couple outfits. And I was like, yes, I do that all the time on my own anyways. Of course, I think that brings value to people. And like, I would do that for way less than I am worth. Um, so creative is a big part for me. This is an interesting point that I didn't really think to mention. How soon did you have brands starting to reach out to you? I will say brands will reach out on a gifting basis way before a paying basis. And if you're a pretty small creator, I think that that's really worth doing if you like the brand in order to just kind of get your foot in the door. You don't wanna like push and ask for way more than you're worth, but say you're just getting started out, you have you know a thousand followers on YouTube and a brand you like says, hey, we would love to gift you $500 of product, um, but they're gonna make you sign a contract and basically do like a, like a sponsorship just for product. In the beginning, I, I took those because it really was proving to the brand that like, hey, I do really good work. I stay on top of my timeline. I do everything asked from me and the contract and it fits my channel well. My audience seems to like it. And then you have this relationship with them. Obviously don't do too many of those, but in the beginning, I do think brands will reach out gifted way sooner than paid. And it's worth considering, it's worth taking. How do you know if a company reaching out to you is legitimate? If you even question it, 
nope, don't do it. Like you want to be so confident in the company you are working with that you want your first impression of them to be good or even better if you already know of them. Like that really is the best. Very rarely do I end up working with brands that I don't know that reach out to me first. If a brand reaches out to me first and I'm not familiar with them, my go-to is I say, I wanna be familiar with you for a while. If you wanna send over some product and I'll try it out, I'll live with it for a bit and then we could talk in like six months. Um, I think that that really brings a lot of value to your audience as a creator. So if you're already worried if a brand is legitimate or not, I say thank you next. Maybe if you're really interested in the product, say feel free to send stuff along and we'll talk down the line. How do you handle constant unsolicited opinions? <laughs> I st I'm still learning, honestly, and that is a big part. I, I tell people that jobs can be three things. They can be physically difficult, they could be mentally difficult, or they could be emotionally difficult. And a lot of times you can get two of the three, like, um, you know, it could be a physically and mentally emotional job. Honestly, I feel like serving is all three because you're keeping track of so much, you're running around on your feet and you're dealing with customers. So you have like the interpersonal. Anyways, I'm going off on a tangent. This job is not physically difficult at all. And it's not mentally difficult, hardly at all, especially if you enjoy being creative and if you're an organized person, but it can be emotionally draining to, um, navigate reading opinions about you all day, every day. You know, I will say therapy boundaries, all sorts of things are helpful, but my honest answer is it just, it gets easier over time. It also like, I find my sensitivity fluctuating quite a bit. Something that has really helped me is just being on TikTok because you get so many ridiculous comments. It's just exposure therapy, honestly. There's hilarious people, there are savage people. And just seeing that many opinions that frequently, especially if a TikTok randomly goes viral and nobody knows you, has been weirdly helpful to me. So this is not, this is not really any advice in any way, shape or form, except for that it gets easier over time. Is it a gamble and not too promising with money? Um, you know, I'll say that it seems like the influencer marketing space is just continuing to grow year after year, but it is such a new young space that like I am constantly in like a frugality mindset, which I shouldn't be at all of being like, who knows? YouTube could go down at any minute, or there could be some sort of new law passed to where, um, companies aren't allowed to advertise through info. You just never know what could change. And so for me, it's not as stable as like working in finance or whatever, but you also don't have an income cap. You can make as much as you want to make one month. You could make negative dollars the next month because you have high expenses and you just don't get as many opportunities. So it's higher risk, higher reward. I would say it's not worth pursuing if you're if you don't love it enough to do it for free. I've had a lot of like friends in real life reach out saying like, "Hey, um, I'm a stay-at-home mom now and I'm looking for easy cash. Can you tell me more about like YouTube?" And I'm like, "Well, if you're looking for easy cash, I will say eventually it gets easier, but like the first few years you're going to be working a lot for free." Free. And that normally <laughs> turns people off. If you make it your full-time job, it's more high risk, but getting started is not high risk because you're not investing a lot of money or anything into starting trying. Advice for someone just starting out. If we're talking about YouTube, I would say just like have a schedule. Um, when I first started out, I did one video a week. And then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try doing two videos a week. And I grew that much quicker. And then I was like, I'm gonna try doing three videos a week. And I grew that much quicker. And just having a consistent upload schedule, I think the algorithm favors you and people remember you more and they wanna come back to see if you've posted something new. There is such a thing as over posting on YouTube. Other platforms like TikTok, not as much, but I have been told by YouTube themselves, this is another interesting thing. For a while I was in a creator program where I would meet with people at YouTube once a week and they would just kind of like, help me strategize and talk through things, things that are rolling out. One thing they told me when I was posting four videos a week is that that's actually harmful to my channel because if you post videos back to back, if like I posted Thursday and Friday, Friday's video would suppress Thursday's video in the algorithm. You want each video to breathe for at least 48 hours because as soon as you post a new one, the last one's gonna get squashed a little bit. So I would say if you're just starting out, post once a week for a while. Don't burn yourself out. Stay on a schedule every Monday, every Wednesday, whatever day you wanna choose, stick to it. And then if you feel like, okay, I got in the groove of this, I'm having fun, 
then up it to twice a week and just do that for a while. Just stick with it. That's my best piece of advice, honestly. Do you turn down brand deals due to not wanting to post too many sponsored videos? All the time. And I have just found that for me, it's easiest to have a set schedule. So my schedule is Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Monday is a themed video. Wednesday, Friday, I'll open up those slots for sponsorship. If a brand reaches out to me and says, we wanna book you for June, and my Wednesday, Fridays are booked for June, I say, I'm so sorry, I'm full for the month but would love to talk July. I still have availability in July if you wanna talk. Um, and that has helped me because my attitude and my mentality is I am an achiever and if I can do more, I want to do more because why not work harder? You know what I mean? But the interesting thing about content creating as opposed to any other job, any other job, if you do more work, you're praised for it. If you take on more clients, you're praised for it. If you're in real estate and you sell more houses, you're praised for it. Social media, if you work with too many brands, it's bad. It's not good, it's not enjoyable for the viewer, it's not a good look, and it's the only job where you can't necessarily take on more work if you want to. It takes the emotion out of it. It's just like now a fact in my mind and that has been really helpful. Do you mention brands naturally not sponsored in hopes of getting a brand deal? Oh yeah, and I think it's very smart to do that because if you really, really love a brand, um, a, it's great to show your audience that you love them before you have a chance to work with them so that they know for a fact it's actually genuine. And you could show the brand you're interested in working in, look, I love you. Here's all the times I've talked about you. An example for me is um, I love Everlane. I've always loved Everlane. And I got to work with them quite a few times over the years through this one agency. And then that agency, I think, stopped working with them. So I didn't have any other contacts. But I just started posting a lot of like TikTok like kind of like clothing things and would tag Everlane. And eventually Everlane themselves, not through an agency reached out and was like, hey, these TikToks are getting a lot of traction. Can we work with you on a TikTok? And I was like, yes, I love you. I think it's actually a super beneficial thing to do, to genuinely talk about the brands you love, especially if you're starting out and wanting to start forming relationships with those brands. When did you start to make money on YouTube? Do you remember how was the feeling? Okay, I have such a specific memory. I was still waiting tables and I got a deal from Lululemon and it was a whole dedicated video, which let me also mention, there's a difference between a sponsorship. So. Some people have asked, what does it mean when they say this portion of the video is sponsored by? That's when a brand says, talk about us for 60 seconds, 90 seconds, whatever. That's most sponsorships. Rarely will a brand ask you to do a dedicated video where the whole video is about that brand. That type of format is like really rare because it's normally not super enjoyable for the viewer unless it's like a haul um, and pays way more because think about how much more you're talking about that brand in a 20 minute video as opposed to 60 seconds. But I remember I got an offer from Lululemon to do a dedicated video for a thousand dollars. And I was just beside myself. I remember back when I was waiting tables, I would keep my cash tips in the little box in my closet and I would wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until I got to be a thousand dollars so that I could see what a thousand dollars looked like in my hand. And then I would go deposit it in my bank. I don't know why, that was just my thing. It like gave me motivation to take more shifts. I remember the day I filmed that Lululemon video, I was like, I just did like two to three weeks of grueling work in this half a day by filming this for Lululemon. It was such a good feeling. It was just so, so liberating yet, yet again. Okay, here's the tea. This says, what is the most you've ever been paid for a brand deal? And this is um, a tricky question because a brand deal can mean so many different things. I've signed six month contracts to where it's like two YouTube videos, five Instagram stories, and a reel every single month for six months. So I don't know if that can be a brand deal or if you mean a single video, like I said, dedicated videos are paid way more than just a normal video. I think the most I've ever been paid for a single deliverable, AKA not like a package with usage, which mind you usage is worth a lot was probably like $6,000, which when you take a step back from that is just shocking that that is even possible. But you also have to remember how much you don't get to keep. That's not profited. <laughs> so management gets 20% and then you're paying out your team and then taxes for me gets about 30%. So at the end of the day, you know, I'd be lucky 
to keep 40 to 50% of that, but I think that that's the most I've been paid for a single deliverable with usage. And it's not always like that. It's not always like that. Sometimes you're like, cool, I can live another month doing this. Awesome. <laughs> this is a little bit more of a detailed question, but more about LLC creation. So I'm an LLC and I file as an S Corp. My accountant has helped me figure out the most like beneficial way to structure my business in terms of taxes, especially. And that is the most financially beneficial way. And then I am a W-2 employee. So technically, you know, when you are a freelancer, you're W-9, you send out 1099s. But I am actually like, I have a whole payroll set up for myself and I get a set paycheck every month from my company to myself. And that is because of just taxes. When you do that, that amount of money is not subject to self-employment tax, which is like a pretty, don't quote me on this, I think it's like 18%. So at least the money that I'm paying myself out of the business saves a good percentage of taxes. So that's just how I've set up my business. I don't have any other W-2 employees. All of my other employees are W-9 in terms of like contracted labor. Technically my business sends out W-9s as the business or 1099s as the business. And then I'm W-2. This is interesting. Do creators have burner accounts to ask questions about where something's from? I've never heard of that, but that's kind of brilliant. Like to like send a DM be like, girl, where's that top from? And like screenshot it yourself. That's smart. I've never heard of that though. Does it feel awkward or embarrassing to film around others? Yes, 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 yes. Um, like in public by myself, just slowly over time, I've just gotten used to the looks. And then I try to be respectful around friends and family. I know which people don't mind at all. Like I know Jacqueline and Kaylee do not care if I'm filming and so I feel more comfortable around them. But when I'm unsure about friends and family wanting to be in a vlog, I'll just get iPhone clips and make it a montage instead of like pulling out my actual camera and talking if that makes sense. How do you handle fear of financial insecurity? For me, it's just, I built up a little emergency fund for myself and my business before I did this full time. So I built up a fund where I could survive off of it just barely for six months myself and my business, probably like three or four months of business expenses before I was like, okay, I feel comfortable doing this full time now. Um, so that was something that I did before quitting my serving job as well. What do you think is the biggest misconception about being a content creator? I really think people don't realize like how business minded you have to be to make it successful. There are so many things behind the scenes where it just looks like, oh, you try on clothes. And yes, that is like the most fun part of it. But really once I got into contract negotiation and all of that, I was like, oh wow. Like I wish I went to college for business. I wish I had a business degree because that would be so helpful in navigating something like this. There's so many good ones, guys. I wanna keep going. Maybe we'll do a part two of this, let me know. But um, I'll save these in case we do. I just don't wanna bore you for too long. I'm gonna end on this last one. How do you deal with the anxiety of having to always do something related to work? For me, it's creating a Sabbath. So one day a week where I'm like, no matter what, I'm not gonna do anything related to work today. And even if I do something that is so fun, it would be great content, I'm not gonna share it. And for me, that's been healthy. That's been a healthy, good little balance. Um, and I wasn't always like that for sure. I was like everything I turned into work and it's just not an enjoyable way to live. So who knows, maybe one day I'll work up the two days a week. A little spicy with him. Guys, there's just so many good ones and I just posted this like a couple hours ago, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and end here because I think I've been talking for forever and I need to go retape my nose. I feel it absolutely ballooning right now and it's such an uncomfortable feeling. I love getting to talk about things a little more candidly and casually instead of it being like a polished, scripted kind of video. It's just a treat for me and I feel like I can connect to y'all better that way too. So thanks for being here. Thanks for making it all the way through. If you made it this far, I'm impressed. I love you. Good luck. If you're starting this, just remember, just be consistent, be genuine, be authentic, and people will say mean things. It's not you. It's not about you. Don't let it get to you. I hope you have the best rest of your day and I'll see you in a video very soon. So let's take all right